Hello everyone, uh, I'm Adam from the Oiko Student Reporter and I have uh, Dr. Steve Kim with me and he will talk more uh, on his presentation on uh, resources depletion and financial instability and he will also give us some uh, ideas on how we solve these problems. I, I heard uh, so many interesting ideas from your uh, presentation and but I would like you to clarify some points sure. uh, mm -hmm. to our you know audience. So for example, the, f uh, the first question that I would like to ask is uh, you talk about Dream must become great growth. So, what is this idea? And what do you well, think about that? The, the, the thing which is left out of so much conventional economic theory, and, and also non conventional, it's not just neoclassicals who don't think about it, it's also post Keynesians, Marxists, etc., etc., is that we live in a physical world and we have to avoid, obey the laws of the physical universe. And the overwhelmingly important law for uh, the physical economy is not the law of gravity, for example, it's the laws of thermodynamics. And they basically talk about how well you can convert existing energy in the universe into products for us. So if you take those laws into account, your explanation for the fact we actually can produce more outputs than inputs every year is actually because we're exploiting free energy in the universe. So if you look at the various theories of economics that have tried to explain where does profit come from, the only ones who got close to it were in fact the physiocrats, who actually predate Adam Smith, they predate Karl Marx, clearly predate the neoclassicals. And their argument was that uh, wealth comes from the sun. Now their mistake was to say that only agriculture can exploit that because only agriculture gets the direct sun. But knowing what we know about physics now, of course, energy is stored from solar, uh, from, from the free from the energy in the universe in all sorts of ways. You know, it's stored in coal, it's stored in, um, nu in nuclear deposits and so on. So we're exploiting all that energy. So we need an energy-based theory of production to begin with. And one essential thing of those laws of third thermodynamics is what's known as the second law. And that is the law that energy degrades over time. So if you start with a very high state of organisation, which is actually a state of what they call low entropy, with only a very small number of ways you can arrange things in a very precise structure. If you imagine like a diamond, for example, there's only, with a given a bunch of carbon molecules, there's only a very limited way to arrange those and get a diamond out of them. But there's plenty of ways to arrange those and get a lump of coal different structure. So the, the highly organised state where the universe begins, the very disordered state is where it ends. Of course production in fact is going in the opposite direction. Not only do we start from a disordered state with raw materials and, and uh, you know, inputs like iron ore and coal and so on, and we turn out Lamborghinis, okay, which is from going from disorganisation to more organisation. It's also the case that every year we have more of those human produced uh, outputs than we have inputs to begin with. Now that's, it, we, so it looks like we're defying a fundamental law of the universe, only there's one problem. You cannot defy a fundamental law of the universe any more than you can hop out of a 60 story building and not hit the ground. You know, you can't defy the second law of thermodynamics. What that therefore means is to produce that economic growth and therefore have more of goods and commodities and, and wealth, we have to be simultaneously producing more waste. There's an inevitable law of the universe. So we know that there's a, there's a, there's a strict uh, link between production and increasing waste. So we need that perspective to begin with and how we can analyse economic theory. Now once you have that, you get a combined economics and ecological perspective on the world. And that tells you that you can actually have increasing production over time, so long as you have two things, free energy to exploit and somewhere to dump the waste energy. Now the, as, as we technologically advance over time, uh, we will ultimately reach the stage where no matter how efficiently we transform free energy into goods, we will ultimately reach the point where the temperature of, of the planet would become unsustainable. Now, the, to give you an idea of that, there's a wonderful uh, discussion between a physicist and an economist called Finite Physicist Meets Exponential Economist on a blog called Follow, uh, Follow, uh, Do the Math. And there's a discussion between a physicist and a, a uh, economist at a conference much like one we're, we're going to right now. And um, the physicist pointed out that if we can maintain the current rate of growth of uh, productivity and population and so on, and, and therefore resource use, I think by about either 250 or 400 years, the temperature of the surface of the planet would be the same as the temperature of the surface of the sun. Now, it clearly tells you we can't keep on going. Okay. So that sort of understanding has to be built into economic theory to begin with, and of course we haven't done it, and that's one of the major reasons why I think economics is actually a negative force 
for coping with the ecological crisis we face now, right now, rather than a positive one. About financing, you know, for all kind of uh, projects or, or how we like improve the situation, it's all about like financing. Yeah. And I, I you have some very interesting uh, point of view on that. Uh, but your ideas is somehow for us, we, we can hear that most of them are contradictory to the conventional uh, wisdom of, of current uh, econo yeah. economists. So uh, how do you try to in, uh, introduce like this a new concept to the world, especially the developed world? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of globally trying to introduce it, what I, what I really find is that to try to convince economists that they need to model the economy as a monetary system uh, is almost wasting my breath. Because, like you said, I'm against the conventional wisdom. Well, the conventional wisdom says you don't need to model money to model a capitalist economy. Now, I think it's absolutely insane, but that's the main mindset economists have got themselves into in the last 130 years, really. It's so locked in, you can't convince established economists, you know, the, the Paul Krugmans of the world, maybe you convince the Joe Stiglitzes of the world, that some, some economists, uh, the Cochranes and so on, the Woodfords, you'll never make them change their minds about modeling the economy, economy the way they do it by and leaving out banks as part of that modeling. So my idea is you can only really convince the new students to think about a new way of doing it. So what I've been doing, and this is very important for me to say right now, I've developed a computer software package that I call Minsky right now that is a way of building monetary, dynamic, macroeconomic models of the economy. It's a platform for doing it. It's not a set model. It's a, a platform which you can design any sort of model uh, that, that is dynamic and monetary. And that is freely available. If you search for Minsky and, and Keen, you'll locate the, the software. Students can download it and play with it. I think it's a far sexier, far more powerful way to model the economy than in intersecting supply and demand curve, which is the standard neoclassical thing. And I'm launching a Kickstarter campaign probably this week to raise money to help develop it further than I've got it so far. It's only had about 600 hours of programming time put into it, which is trivial. And I want to put 60,000 hours in there, so I'm trying to raise you know, 20 times as much as I've spent so far. So people can help out by helping fund that Kickstarter program. Uh, that helped me communicate the ideas because until you see there's a different way to think about the economy, everybody will fall back into intersecting supply and demand curves. So you've got to see that there's an alternative perspective and that it's much more powerful and liberating. And that's the main thing I'm trying to do. I think it applies whether talking about a developed or a developing economy. But fundamentally, it, 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 it brings two things to the focus. First of all, it says you must model capitalism as a monetary system. So you look at all the monetary flows and in the third world, that include you know what happens to money lenders in the third world villages and things like that, right through to the role of major financial corporations. Uh, and it's fundamentally dynamic. You, you can't model the economy without being dynamic in, in your perspective. And most economists don't lead, learn dynamics, so I've actually embedded dynamics into the fabric of this program, and people will be able to build dynamic monetary models, essentially without even knowing they're doing it but it'll be giving them very, very different results and a very different vision to what they get from intersecting supply and demand curves. Yes. So uh, we can see, um, you know, it, it will take some time for, for, the, for uh, the people to try to like, accept this uh, idea. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, we have some uh, life example that maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, for example, like China. Yeah. Because in, in the presentation you said, oh, China's uh, doing a good job like, in financing the project. So can, what uh, experience or what like, out outcome can we learn from uh, China? Well, pa partly we've got to be careful about the extent to which things like uh, what's happened in China are specific to that particular economy at that time in its development. But one thing I was looking at with China in particular is that uh, China, of course, was a you know, de very unindustrialized nation mere, a mere 30 years ago. And their way of industrializing was to you know, throw away the whole uh, collectivist attitude that they had under Mao. And so we want to industrialize and bring the Western technology into China and build very rapidly. And what they did, which is very different to a lot of uh, Asian countries that also tried export-oriented industrialization, where they'd open up free trade zones and invite Western corporations to establish production facilities there. Most other countries did that and saw it as a way of getting their labour employed and getting some technology, but they didn't insist upon ownership. And what the Chinese did was they said, yes, you can open up in a free trade zone. Yes, it'll be far cheaper for you because uh, capital costs will be lower, environmental costs will be lower, and wage costs will be far lower. But you must start with a Chinese partner. And within seven years, that Chinese partner must have a, a certain proportion of the business of the order of 50%. Now, 
that was a, a strong bargain to put to the American firms who were relocating. But the, the enticing margin was that huge gap between you know, wage cost in America and wage cost in China. So they were willing to accept that deal. And out of that, you have the growth of enormous Chinese corporations now, but they've actually captured some of the surplus generated from those factories. So rather than all the profit going overseas and the wages staying locally, some of the profits stayed in China and could then be reinvested. And you had a dramatic industrialization of that country over a 30 or 40 year period, plus uh, you know, also the, the growth of technological know-how. So that's the thing which I think China has done, which is very, very special. It isn't necessarily reproducible, because now at the point we are, in, both in, in the extent to which in industry has been relocated to China, uh, and also the stage of technological development, there's no guarantee any other country can repeat that process again. But what they can repeat is the need to be nationally focused. And that's what China did, even though it went for, you know, socialist to capitalist. It was still a national policy saying we're trying to build a national economy. To have a national economy, you must have capitalists and investment as well as workers home and working in advanced factories. And they managed to build them both. And then out of that, you had a successful transformation of China versus the you know, very, very poor performance of Russia in a similar transition largely because the Russians have followed the advice of conventional economists and the Chinese told them to take a hike and did their own thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for all of this interesting and unique insights um, and hope you have a good time in, in Bangkok too. Thank you.